Today on Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy, a lesson on having the courage to choose a side. I hold between two opinions. <laughs> Can't ride the fence. My friend, we need to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's high time. Our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. We need to put off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Amen. Let's be a profile in courage. We can be on the fence about many things, our favorite foods, our favorite teams, and sometimes even political issues. But when it comes to the gospel, it's all or nothing. Welcome to Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy. Today, Pastor Philip shares an urgent message about choosing sides and why when it comes to your relationship with Christ, you can't have it both ways. That's the title of today's lesson. And if you'd like to listen online, you'll find this message and its previous segments at ktt.org. Let's listen now. Here's Pastor Philip. This is a day in which men need to stand up and speak out and stand out for the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's take our Bibles and go to 1 Kings chapter 18. In the face of today's moral ambiguity and aggressive secularism outside the church and doctrinal plasticity inside the church, we might wonder if the evangelical church in America will not in the near future have to accuse itself of not holding to its beliefs more courageously. Our condemnations of the surrounding culture are few, while our compromises with the surrounding culture are many. We need to be unashamed of the gospel. That's why I want to pursue this new series with you, Profiles in Courage. Because every man under my voice this morning needs to be a profile in courage. So, all of that said, this call to be a profile in courage brings us to look at our first profile in courage, the prophet Elijah, a man who had the courage to challenge his culture. And so, let's look at this man. Several things jump out in the text if you're taking notes, the first thing I want you to notice is the command, verse 1. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, go present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the earth. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab, and there was a severe famine in Samaria. A wicked king with a wicked queen has led Israel astray, and they have followed like sheep to the slaughter. And the time has come to act. I want you to notice the contrast. One is a prophet, the other is a civil servant, both serving the Lord. One is loud, boisterous. The other is quiet, somewhat unassuming. The Bible never tells us there's only one kind of faithful servant. It never demands that you must be an Elijah clone. Models are helpful, but slavish imitation of them is foolish. And to be honest, some of us may become Elijahs in our generation, but most of us probably going to be an Obadiah. Isn't it a wonderful thing also here in this text to see where God places his servants in hard places? I hear a lot that they have of Christians wishing to escape hard places. And yet in the Bible, God has his servants in hard places. I mean, Elijah is a flower growing in a scrapyard. What about Paul telling us right at the end of his letter to the Philippians, I greet you, and some within Caesar's household greet you? Woo! That's the command. That's the contrast. What about the contradiction? This is verses 16 to 18. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. Then it happened. When Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? 
And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. And here's the contradiction. Ahab calls Elijah the troublemaker when in reality he's the source of Israel's woes. Here's the point, practical point, something for you to, to kind of chew on this week. Now, you maybe noticed this, but let me remind you if you haven't, and if you haven't, this is a wake-up call. Do you notice in the Bible the pattern is this, that the world often sees the people of God as the threat, even though they have brought about their own demise and disaster. Like the Savior, we can be despised and rejected by men. I don't have time to go here, but if you, if you go to Luke 23, verses 2 and 5, when the Jews present Jesus to Pilate, they say, you know what? He's the one that's perverting the nation. He's stirring up the crowds. He's creating mayhem on the streets. The Prince of Peace. Same was said of Paul in Acts 24, verse 5, that he's the ringleader of the Nazarenes. He's a rabble rouser. He's unsettling the status quo and cultural equilibrialism. The point is this, guys, as one writer says, our Lord was nailed to a cross, and you can be counted on being nailed to the wall. Now, we may not like it, and we may have grounds for complaint, but at the same time, you and I need to embrace the idea that this culture will mock us. It will portray us on television as stupid. It will make us the scapegoats for their own sins, their own failures. Just get used to it. What is being is, what is will be. In fact, we need to turn the corner and stop belly aching about it and maybe get to a Acts 5 verse 41 where we kind it worthy to suffer for him. If you become the pinata in your university classroom or in the workspace or wherever the case might be, embrace that because our Savior was rejected and despised by man. If you look anything like him, you preach his gospel and you stand for his truths, the same will happen to you. They nailed him to the cross. They will nail you to the wall. Listen to this from A.W. Pink. It is the duty of God's servants to warn men of their danger to point out the way of rebellion against God leads to certain destruction and to call upon them to throw down the weapons of their revolt and flee from the wrath to come. It is their duty to teach men that they must turn from their idols and serve the living God. Otherwise, they will be eternally lost. It is their duty to rebuke wickedness wherever it is found and declare the wages of sin is death. This will not make them popular for it will condemn and irritate the wicked and such plain speaking will seriously annoy them. Those who expose hypocrites, resist tyrants, oppose the wicked, are ever viewed by them as troublemakers. But as Christ declared, blessed are you when men shall revile you, persecute you, say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets. Is that you, Elijah, O troubler of Israel? And so they persecuted the prophets which were before you. Nero in his madness burned down the city of Rome and he scapegoat the Christians. I was thinking about Martin Luther, the Protestant reformer, and how God gave him the strength and the courage to confront the apathy and apostasy that marked the church of his day, the mercenary use of indulgences, the authority of the Pope over Scripture, the immorality of the priesthood, the loss of the doctrine of justification by faith alone. And so he spoke up. He wrote 95 protestations, and, and he put them on the door of the church in Wittenberg, which was basically the place where people read their morning news. But on June the 15th, 1520, Pope Leo X issued a papal bull entitled, O Rise, O Lord, in which he condemned Luther and called for his immediate restraint. And he complained about this wild boar that had entered God's vineyard. So it wasn't the popes and all their financial corruption and sexual immorality and theological compromise that troubled the church. It was Luther the wild boar from Germany who had entered God's vineyard. 
Guys, that's the way it is. That's the way it was. Let's get to a last thought here for a few minutes. We'll wrap this up. The choice. It's a lot here. That's why we're doing it over a month or two. The choice. So we read verse 19. Now therefore send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal, and the 400 prophets of Asheroth who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and, and gathered the prophets to gather on Mount Carmel. Verse 21, it's a great, great verse. And Elijah came to all the people and said, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. The choice. Elijah proposes to Ahab a battle of the gods, an elimination contest. And he asked them to gather the clans of Israel to watch it and witness it. And they did come. People will come out for a good fight. And they did. And with all Israel before him, Elijah calls on the people to make a choice. And he challenges them. How long will you falter between two opinions? It's a word that carries the idea of limping. Later on in the, in the chapter, verse 26, we read here, and then they leaped about the altar, which they had made, speaking about the prophets of Baal. They kind of were dancing feverishly around the altar. We'll get to that next month. But the point, this is a word that kind of limping, where you kind of favor one foot rather than another. Or you kind of dance around something. And in many ways, Elijah is saying, hey, you can no longer dither and you can no longer dance around the issue. I'm going to call your bluff. If God is the Lord, then follow him. If Baal, follow him. But no more riding the fence. No more doing the spiritual splits. No more hokey pokey. And we're at church, and we're at a Bible study, and we're praying, and we're all excited, and then we put one foot out. We're back in the world, carnal, pursuing relationships that are unholy and healthy. We're like that. And it's dangerous, and it's damning. And, and Elijah wants to challenge them about that. One writer said this. They thought that they could sacrifice their children to Baal on a Friday and then sacrifice a lamb to God on Saturday. Amazing. They thought they could do that, but they couldn't. Israel had not totally rejected the Lord, but was seeking to combine devotion to Jehovah and worship of Baal. But here's the problem. Syncretism, ecumenicalism, pluralism, blending of traditions and doctrines is not compatible with Judeo-monotheism. All right, Israel knows the Shema. There is one God. Love him with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. God's singularity demands exclusive allegiance and unbridled devotion. I mean, if the God of Israel exists, the God who wrote the Ten Commandments, the God who speaks through the prophets, the God who has done miraculous deeds within history, the God who governs all of life. If that God exists, then he demands exclusive allegiance and unbridled devotion. The true God is the ultimate reality. And if he is true and he exists, then his claims are absolute. And that's what's being, you know, set before the people here. It's kind of the logic that gripped the heart of C.T. Studd, right? If Jesus Christ be God, that's true. That he's not a creation of God. He's not a spiritual emanation from the ether world. But he's God come in human flesh miraculously by means of virgin birth, the offspring of the Holy Spirit. If Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice is too great for me to make for him. And that's why C.T. Studd 
put his cricket bat down, was a cricket star in England, silver spoon in his mouth, part of the gentry of the English society, and went to China, blazed the trail for God. Because, <laughs> you know what? If God is ultimate, then his claims are absolute. You don't get to sit on the fence. You don't get to domesticate God. You don't get to pick and choose what commandments of his you're going to obey. You don't get to give him half your week and keep the rest for yourself. You don't get to put one foot in and one foot out, right? You don't get to do that. Joshua said to the people of God, choose this day whom you will serve. Jesus said, you can serve me in money. You can serve two masters. Jesus said, you're either for me or you're against me. He condemns the church at Laodicea. I'd rather have you hot or cold. I can't stand this lukewarmness. God's singularity demanded exclusive allegiance and unbridled devotion. And as we close, we want to be challenged by that. The Western civilization, it stands at a crossroads. Listen to these words from Philip Graham Rykam. We have started down the road to destruction. Perhaps the way of life still stretches out before us. The ethical dilemmas we face show that we are at a crossroads. Will we cherish the lives of the innocent or will we permit abortion on demand? Will we protect the lives of the defenseless or will we allow involuntary euthanasia? Will we preserve the sanctity of marriage or will we tolerate no-fault divorce and homosexual unions? Will we love the true and the beautiful or will we gaze upon images of sex and violence? These are the questions a culture faces at the crossroads. The evangelical church, he says, is also standing at the crossroads. Will we glorify God in our worship or will we entertain ourselves? Will we bear witness to the law of God and the grace of the gospel, or will we tone down our message so as not to offend anybody? Will we expound the eternal word of God, or will we seek some new revelation? Will we defend the doctrine of justification by faith alone, or will we add works to grace? These are the questions a church faces when it stands at the crossroads. Guys, our culture is at a crossroads. As you work out your faith with fear and trembling in a wicked culture, every day you'll face crossroads, ethical and moral and theological, where you're going to have to make a stand for Jesus Christ. But if Jesus Christ be God and died for you, then there's no sacrifice, no mockery that you shouldn't be willing to pay for him. Choose this day whom you will serve. Why halt you between two opinions? Let me finish with this story that comes out of the book Driven from Within by Michael Jordan, a famous athlete, one of the greatest, if not the greatest basketball player ever. In the book, he tells of a visit to the home of a basketball player named Fred Whitfield in Charlotte, North Carolina, played for the Hornets. And Jordan asked him while he was there, hey, have you got a jacket I could borrow? We're not told why he needed the jacket, but he needed a jacket. And so Whitfield pointed him to a closet and Michael Jordan went in and he noticed that there were Nike jackets and Puma jackets. So he comes back into the living room with all the Puma jackets, lays them on the floor, goes to Fred's kitchen, picks a butcher's knife and proceeds to cut them all to shreds. Then he threw them in the dumpster. He returned and angrily said to his friend, don't ever let me see you in anything but Nike. You cannot ride the fence. I'm going to guess Nike sponsored Jordan. That's my assumption. <laughs> but I love the story. Nike or Puma, make your mind up. Why halt between two opinions? Can't ride the fence. My friend, we need to put on the Lord Jesus Christ high time. Our salvation is near than when we first believed. We need to put off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Amen. Let's be a profile in courage. Father, we thank you for the beginning of this series. We recognize the need for courage in the Christian life. We live behind enemy lines. We're going to need to be like Joshua strong and very courageous. 
We're going to need to be like David. We're going to need to wait on the Lord and be of good courage. We need to be like the Corinthians and Paul said, you know what, act like man. Be strong and be brave. We realize that we live in a culture that wants to squeeze us into its mold, wants us to conform, wants us to compromise, wants us to blend in, wants us to surrender our exclusive relationship with Jesus Christ, His law and His life and His love. Help us as we journey through these great biblical characters to be challenged, to take up the the gauntlet that they throw at our feet. We thank you that throughout the ages, men and women have stood boldly and bravely for Jesus Christ, and we must do the same in our generation. Lord, help us not to turn back in the day of battle. Help us, Lord, to uh, run the gauntlet of their mockery and their shaming of us and their scapegoating of us. Help us to be unashamed of the gospel. Help us to expose the works of darkness. Help us to stand in this evil day. We thank you that the spirit within and the word without and the hope that lies ahead gives us reason enough to show physical and moral courage uh, in this hour. Oh, as Guinness has put his finger on it, this is a clarifying moment in the West. It is no time for cowards, for fence-sitters, or for those that heads their bets. So, Lord, we pray that we'll answer the bell and we'll join the good fight of faith and be stalwarts of the faith, uncompromising men of God unwavering in our doctrine, unbowed in our conduct. For we ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're listening to Philip DeCourcy on Know the Truth in a message titled, You Can't Have It Both Ways. Listen again at ktt.org. Well, for the next few weeks, Pastor Philip will be encouraging us to cultivate courage in a godless society because Philip at Know the Truth We understand the importance of applying God's Word to our daily lives. That's right, Wayne. Know the Truth exists to share the gospel with the world in need of truth through the preaching of the Word of God so that believers are, one, encouraged daily in their faith to learn and live biblically, so that, two, they're equipped to serve their local church and community, and so that, three, they become engaged in sharing the gospel everywhere as they go. And we remain committed to standing firm for Christ and on the unchanging truth of His Word. It's God's Word that transforms lives. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. That's why it's our goal to provide people of all ages and all stages of life the opportunity to read, listen, and watch biblical teaching for free. But we can't do it without you, our listeners. It's your listening, sharing, and giving that keeps Know the Truth on air and sharing the gospel with thousands of listeners each day. So, we hope you'll continue to listen each day, and you'll also join us on this venture, even adventure, of helping others know the truth. All right. Thank you, Philip. And the best way you can get involved is by becoming one of our Truth Ambassadors. These monthly supporters help reach listeners all over the world with God's Word. And when you sign up this month, we'll send you a book to help you navigate the world of tech. It's called God, Technology, and the Christian Life. Ask for your copy by calling 888-644-8811 or visit ktt.org. You can also write to Know the Truth, Post Office Box 30250, Anaheim Hills, California, 92809. I'm Wayne Shepherd, inviting you back tomorrow when Philip begins Part 2 of today's message, It's coming up Friday on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free.